Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Tuesday, March the 13th, 2018, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, your first daily dose of happy for the day. And we are just, we're almost even happier than we were on Monday, which doesn't actually surprise a lot of people because they think that Mondays are really bad days. We were pretty happy yesterday. Um, <laughs> in fact, we, it, it, the amazing thing, Cindy, is we were happy in the morning, despite the fact that Tom and I were working on a new book, we're working on a Seth book, and I don't know if you've read Seth, but I have not actually read it. I've seen like a couple of videos of, of when Jane Roberts was alive and, and channeling Seth, and it was really unpleasant to listen to because the voice was not comfortable, and, and uh, you know, it, was, it was just a tough experience. Well, reading it apparently is just as difficult because it's really dense material. So we've done a couple days of reading this very dense material, and we decided, no, we got to switch that around. That's not going to work too well. But the, the strange thing is, even with that, we were still feeling good. It was great. And I think it's because we've had this daily dose of happy going on for so long that even with a day that didn't work out so good in the beginning, it was still good. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> I was it, happy yesterday, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, good things are happening no matter what, what you look at and what you're dealing with. It's just a question of whether or not we're willing to see them. Which reminds me of something. This morning, early this morning, I woke up and I had a flashback kind of memory back to when I was in the early years of my life. You know, roughly ages like, I don't know, three to nine or something like that. Oh. And the the memory was of, it, it was more of an emotion slash sense memory than it was an actual event. It was more like a series of events and how it felt. And it was, it was the memory of becoming more real. And by becoming more real, I mean acclimating myself to the physical real world where my parents were my big influencers and so on and so forth. And noticing, now I, this is me talking from now looking back, noticing that during that time period, I was becoming less and less happy. Not because my parents were mean to me or anything like that, but just because I was moving away from what I already previously knew about how the universe is. And I was buying into the... Um, the messages that we get, not just from parents, but from teachers and schools, religions, everything. Um, all those messages were taking shape inside of me. And I remember I was feeling sadder and sadder. I wasn't feeling sad, but less happy, less happy, less happy. I guess it's probably the best way to say it. And now I realize what I'm trying to learn to do is to recapture that ability to deliberately feel happy again. So when I woke up this morning... I did my mirror exercise day twenty three. I'm going. I'm still doing the, the so mirror awesome. exercise. Oh, it's great. I'm really surprised in, in one sense because I've in, historically I have not been good at doing a repetitive exercise, um, an affirm, affirmation type exercise or something where it's just the same repetitive thing every day for day after day after day. And here I am on day twenty three. This is great. I love this. So anyway, as I'm doing my mirror exercise, I decided I wanted to make it an intention to not only love myself, but also to say, I want to get practice at dreaming big dreams. And not just any kind of dreams, positive dreams. In other words, I want to get practice at building the positive emotion associated with dreams and to do it deliberately, not just waiting for it to happen. Which, of course, we've been trying to do for years, right? I mean, you and I talked about that before the show. We, that's what right. we try to do. But it, it just, the, the, the juxtaposition of it, of, of the early memory where I could remember myself kind of falling into the way physical life works, and then me now trying to realize I want to go in the opposite direction of that, and I want, I want to make myself get there. I want to, to deliberately put myself there and, and move that emotional set point. That was a pretty dramatic feeling. And, and well, that memory is really amazing. It is. It is an amazing memory. It's not one that I remember having before. So uh, apparently I am breaking through some resistance barriers, which is good. Well, that makes me think that's, that's not sort of like just, oh, a random memory of something. That's something that like your higher, wiser self brought to you this morning and served up to you. Like, here you go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
and and, uh, and I caught it on the backhand, so it was good. You know? <laughs> I actually returned serve. <laughs> wow! The, I mean, that's yeah, that's really amazing to me. Yeah, that's it a, is. I loved that's it. A deep it, recollection. It, it was a good event all the way around. the The one thing that surprised me, though, well, it didn't surprise me, but it brought to my attention yet again how. Um, remarkable and notable this phenomenon is when i was trying to freeze to uh, phrase for myself this morning while doing my mirror work the way that i wanted to take control of my emotions i had to go through like five six seven different ways of saying it and each time i i came up with one i said no no no, that's wrong because i realized the way i was saying it was creating a negative it's like no Okay, let's rephrase it this way. And so I'd start to phrase it. And no, that doesn't work either. I kept having to find that way to say, I want to have positive control of my emotions. Now, you wouldn't think that would be so difficult to say if you just kind of looked at it, you know, casually. But for those of us who are regularly trying to do it, it's amazing how difficult that is. <laughs> I mean, it's just astonishing. But it's amazing I did it. how anything that's not like already, you know, ingrained in us as a habit can right. be so- Difficult, even when it seems some like it's something really simple, and then mm. we try to verbalize it, and it's like, oh, it's not that simple. <laughs> well, I had a lot of practice with it over the weekend. Um, I had a really fun manifestation event happen. I was on Saturday. I, w- I was going to do editing on the book on Saturday, but I had kind of a uh, not a tough week, but I, I, w- I was tired from the week. I just needed to take the, the weekend break. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do the editing um, starting on Sunday, which I did. And I wasn't really sure what to do. Louise had gone away for the day. And so I said, you know what, I'll, I'm going to play some poker because I'm an online poker player. And we're now in the time where, uh, because the U.S. government has decided that people can't be responsible for their own behavior, we're now at a time where you can't play for money online, which I miss because I, I was really good at it. <laughs> you could make money playing poker online. But this is just for play chips, and that's okay. It's still competitive. It's still, you know gets my juices going and gives me a chance to, to practice my skills. So I'm, I'm sitting down and playing the games, and I was in two particular tournaments. I love playing tournaments. They're much more fun to me. Um, I was in two particular tournaments, one of which had they had like 700 people in the tournament. It was a really big tournament. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. You get some pretty good-sized ones. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm in the tournaments, and this one in both of these tournaments, I wasn't doing very well. I, I, my mind wasn't really focusing the way it needed to. And I wasn't in a good emotional space either. Now, I have tried to use Law of Attraction previously when playing poker, and my results have been abysmally bad. <laughs> <laughs> I do much better when I just play with my skill than I do when I use Law of Attraction. And what occurred to me as I was playing and losing chips, I might add, as I was losing chips, I was thinking to myself, why is it that I have so much trouble? Because I had actually tangibly tried some... Uh, law of attraction, and it wasn't working. In fact, it was working about as badly as it always had. And I said, what, what is it that I'm doing? And I finally realized I was trying to micromanage the hands. I was trying to, to use the law of attraction to influence how each hand would work out. Mm-hmm. And it finally occurred to me, I'm not letting the universe do it the way it wants to do it. I'm trying to make it happen my way, and so I'm putting artificial limits in place that are actually blocking me. I said, well, shoot, that's pretty stupid. Why am I doing that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I changed my, my plan. Instead of trying to get a particular card to make a good hand or something like that, I just put it out there. I have X number of chips. I want X times two. And then as I thought about X times two, then I would get all excited about that. <laughs> so that was the plan. Okay, all right. Well, I'll give that a shot. That sounds like a good plan. It sounds a lot more reasonable than what I was trying to do before. And it takes a whole lot less work. That's usually a good sign. <laughs> well, you don't have to do as much work. That's usually a good sign you're on the right track. So Yeah, it reminds okay. me of that, where, how we always have this tendency to go towards how. Yes. The hows. It's like, oh, okay, yes. I just need I just need a king or whatever. You know, That's it's like, right. no, we don't. The universe can take care of the hows. Exactly right. <laughs> I love yeah. this story. And plus, I was also trying to practice what you and I have talked about and Wendy and, and Tom and I really have been talking about it with everybody. And that is tapping into impulses, you know, little uh, uh, things that come to me about, you know, give this a try and, and going with it. And I was trying to practice doing it even when my poker sense was saying, that's a really stupid move to make. Don't Ooh. do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was a challenge. But I got to the point, you, you start these tournaments with about 1,500 chips, and I was down to about half that amount. So I said, well, 
I'm already way, way behind anyway. We might as well start doing it with this. We'll treat this as like the sandbox to try to practice in, right? So, okay. Right. You know, so what the heck? Got nothing to lose. It's only play chips anyway. I got about 78 million of them in my account. So what do I care? So <laughs> I, I really do. I really do. I've been quite successful over the years. So, all right. Well, what, let's just, just, just mess around with it. So I started messing around with just the little plan that I told you about. I started with 700. I said, you know, okay, my first goal is to get back to 1500. Okay. And a few hands later, without trying to do anything other than just you know playing my normal game and not not thinking about it, not getting attached to any particular hand. I think uh, if a hand didn't work out, yeah, so what? Big deal. Just playing with that mentality. Soon I was at fifteen hundred. Like, well, that's cool. Oh. And it was on both tables. Okay, well that's cool. Well, let's go for three thousand. Okay, so we went for three thousand. Got to three thousand. Got to uh -huh. six thousand. Got to nine thousand. And then on one of the tables, I made a really dumb mistake. I tried to make it happen with all my chips and lost. So I was out of that tournament. But I was still in the other tournament. I said, okay, got it. Won't do that one again. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, kept playing again. Okay, the next goal was to get to 20,000. 20,000 chips, okay. Well, I've done that before. It's not easy to do, but I've done that before. Okay, let's go for that. So I just started holding that in my mind and got a really big hand. I said, oh, this is cool. But I only won about 3,000 chips out. I couldn't get somebody to really bet big on it. And I said, well, oh, well, that's the way it works. But the, the person who had bet with me was, was down to a small number of chips himself, and my win had knocked him out of the game. I'd forgotten that the tournament I was in also gives you bonuses if you knock somebody out. Guess how many chips I got as a bonus for knocking him oh, out? Oh, no. How many? 20,000. <laughs> <laughs> So I kept going. The next goal was like 30,000, and I got to 30,000. The next goal was 50,000. I got to 50,000. I'm saying, this is great. I love this. And each time it was the same thing. I would just set the goal, and I get real excited, and I'm thinking about, wow, I'm going to be so happy when I get to 50,000 or whatever the number was, you know? And then I'd get there like, okay, great. This is working. Let's do it for the next number. I'd go for the next number, get real excited in my mind, and sure enough, it would show up a few hands later. I got up to 500,000 ships. There aren't a lot of people left in the tournament now. This is a tournament that had 700 people. It's down to about 18 at this point. Wow. And, you know, and, and I've gotten there before. I've gotten to that place before. So it's, it's rarefied air. But I, I had gotten there. But not only had I gotten there, I was in first place. I mean, you get 500,000 ships with 18 people left. You're going to be in first place. And I was. I said, well, well. Now I know what to do. I'm just going to captain this table. Well, captaining the table means that you, you bet intimidating bets to get people to fold. And if you play it right, you can actually win that way. I didn't play it right. I lost half my chips. I said, okay, here I am. I'm micromanaging again. I get it. I'm sorry. I'll stop. <laughs> so I went back to the same old routine. Okay, I just want to visualize where I want to get to next. I worked my way up to 500,000, worked my way up to 600,000. And by that time... There were only two of us left in the tournament. I was going to say, now you're like two or three people, right? There's yeah. only two left. And the other guy was the guy I was butting heads with most of the time. And I had like 600,000. He had 400,000. I said, okay, well, I want a million. I want all the chips. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a hand, King 9, which is not really strong. It's not bad, but it's not a really strong hand. And I said, I'm going to bet it aggressively. So I raised, which I wouldn't normally do, but I raised. And he called, and it turned out he called holding a queen seven, which is also a relatively not strong hand. It's not terrible, but it's not a strong hand. So we both called with relatively weak hands. The flop came king, king, seven. <laughs> I had three of a kind kings. He had a pair of sevens. <laughs> now, one thing you have to understand about poker is on any given hand, especially if you're playing what they call the, uh, the no limit um, uh, poker, is that... On a flop, the odds of you matching at least one of your cards are about four to one against. And he knew that just as well as I did. Well, he had matched his sevens. And he saw two kings on the board, so he knew that the odds of me matching one of the kings was even less. So he figured he had the advantage. Yeah. He went all in. I called him. Oh. I won the <laughs> tournament. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I won the entire tournament just using the law of attraction. You know, the thing I love about this story is that the times that you got, um, what's the best, what I'm hearing is that the times where the, you got, had a little bit of resistance, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay, oh, I got to manage this now. Like, That's this right. Is, okay. <laughs> and the, and yet 
and it was the perfect lesson. It was the perfect yes. thing for you to go, oh, okay, yeah, no, wrong direction. Got to go back to this, <laughs> you know, feeling good about it before it happens. It's Mike Dooley's That's make amazing. a legal U-turn. <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, That's yeah. it. Make then, a legal U turn. And the best next. part was apparently Poker Stars. That's where I play. They have a a new thing now. If you win a tournament, they send you an email that can, contains a link to a video, and the video is as if your tournament was on TV and you were on TV. And they, they you can see people moving chips around and and cards hitting the deck and so forth. And they were replaying <laughs> key hands in the tournament. This, this is the story of my win of the tournament. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So I got a chance to replay it. I got a chance to play the victories. The funniest parts were that they they picked the, the, of course, it's a random system. You know, the system's basically picking out a couple of key plays and, and, and turning it into a video, so to speak, on the fly. The key points that it chose to pick were two of my worst plays strategically from a, from a poker point of view. But they were my best from an LOA perspective because they're plays I would never have made from a pro poker perspective. One this time, is even better. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. One of them was I had <laughs> 10 and 9 of hearts, which is called suited connectors. And it's a, it's, it's a good kind of hand to have if you want to try to get a straight or a flush or something like that. The problem, of course, is that the odds of getting those are enormously high, which means you don't really bet them really big. So what did I do? I went all in. <laughs> now, why did I go all in? I don't know. I just had an impulse to go all in, so I went all in. And on, uh, after I went all in, I got called. I put my cards down. He put his cards down. He had two aces, the best possible pocket you can have. The odds of me winning in that hand were about one in ten, and I won. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is so great. Then the second so one that they showed, I had an ace two. Again, God knows why. I went all in. Would I have normally gone in with an ace-two? Absolutely not. That's insane. You don't do that. And sure enough, my opponent had an ace-queen, which means that, again, the odds of him winning were about five to one. Well, that was a really dumb play. Guess who won the hand? <laughs> I mean, it was just amazing. <laughs> so you not only got this, like, amazing, um, you know, clinic, right? Right. <laughs> an LOA clinic. An LOA poker clinic. But then you got the video. I got the video to replay my stupidest <laughs> plays, which were my smartest ones from the perspective of going with an impulse that came to me out of nowhere. Yeah. I just <laughs> love that it was the, the worst strategic <laughs> plays. And that it was like, this is the evidence of <laughs> LOA being the way to go here. Oh, my goodness. What? It was just, I, I was just laughing. And, and it, the best part, though, was I was succeeding over and over and over again and getting myself ex excited about the next thing that had not yet shown up because that's always been a big bugaboo for me. So to get myself emotionally excited about achieving something that hadn't come and not knowing how it was going to happen and doing it consistently over and over again, that was huge for me. That was really huge. That's a fantastic story. Yeah. I'm thinking I may wow. actually include that one in the book. Just add and another story. Yes. You know? Yes. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. I think I'll do that. Okay. It's so funny because we're always talking about wins, and this was like a literal win. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a literal like a win, win, right. <laughs> with, with about 700 people in the tournament. <laughs> right? Oh, my goodness. I think I won three and a half million ships on or some ridiculous amount like that. <laughs> oh. Did you ever have the thought of, oh, why can't we be playing for money? <laughs> David said that to me. He, David, I told David the story on Sunday. He says, well, you got to go to the casino. And my response to him was, no, I don't want to go to the casino yet because I want to make sure I can yeah. do this consistently anytime I sit down at the table because I don't like to gamble. I like to invest. And to me, the difference is investment is where I expect to get back my investment and then some, whereas gamble means I'm risking getting nothing back. Right. And I'm, not, I'm not really interested in that. So, well, plus, this is a different kind of thing because it's one thing to be playing with skill and strategy. Yep. But it's completely different when the, when the skill and strategy are now LOA skills and LOA strategy. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I want to make sure I've got that down. And by the time I get that down, I probably won't want to go to a casino anyway. I'll be playing the game right. of life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You'll realize you don't have to go to the no, casino. No, <laughs> no. I mean, I may just go to a casino just for the fun of it, but... And the other thing, too, you go to a casino, 
you're actually sitting at the table with these other people. You're doing it on right. your, at home on your computer. It's just you know a little graphic on a screen. But now you got all these other people sitting around the table, you know, trying to do all that they can to knock you off balance so that you play badly. Like, well, yeah, right. that, just what I want, and, right? <laughs> and, ener- and energy entrains to itself. So, oh yeah, Absolutely. right. So you'd have all the energetic interference or exactly. whatever you want to call it with the rest of the table. So it definitely would be a different experience. I mean, the only reason I would want to do it is if I wanted to e- even strengthen my resolve more. Because I could see I get myself to a certain skill level and going to a live poker table is a way to, to practice you know, staying in my zone and not allowing myself to be distracted by that other stuff. But that's an advanced step. That's not a beginner step by any stretch. You know, so, that is definitely the advanced step. Yeah, it would be a, it would be like the next level of training. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so I, I'll I'll do that perhaps at some point, but it's not a high priority on my list. <laughs> well, it was a great story, a great a great experience. Well, How thank fun. you. That, I, I I probably should have asked you first because now I feel like I've overshadowed you. But do you have any good stories? Any wins? <laughs> well, yeah, the two wins that I, that come to mind right away. One is. You know, last week I had a sore throat and, you know, normally in the past, I mean, I've had, I've had colds like anyone else Mm -hmm. in my life and there's sort of a, a certain steps that happen, right? It's like the first thing is, oh, a little scratchy throat and then this and that and pretty soon it's okay, I'm, I'm getting a cold or whatever. (laughs) And I didn't say that this time. I didn't expect it. I didn't, I didn't just acquiesce to the idea that, okay, well, yep, looks like I'm getting a cold. I started pivoting because that's what we've been learning about in the book. And that's been my main practice over the past couple of weeks, just because reading about it again has brought it up to me, you know, to to think about. So it would be immediate to me to say, okay, no, I'm not going to go down that train of thought of looks like I'm getting a cold. I w- I'm just going to say, what do I want? I want to feel good, healthy, vibrant. And That's the good. sticking part was, why do I want to feel good? And that sounds so silly, but I'd be like, because I don't want to feel bad, but we've talked about <laughs> That's this. Right. We've talked yes. about, no, it can't be, you know, I want to be rich. Why? Well, because I don't want to be poor. No, you got to have a better <laughs> reason than that. Because if I'm saying I want to feel good because I don't want to have a cold, I'm still focused on the cold. That's right. So I've come up with so many reasons why I want to feel good. And every time it's worked every time, every time I've felt it coming on again, that's what I've done. And before you know it, I don't notice it. The other win is, you know, that we've. <laughs> no, don't, don't skip over that. That's a big win. That, yeah, that, that's yeah, a really yeah, big no. win right and there. It's and it's exciting because it, it caused me to recognize that my whole life, whenever I've, I'm making air quotes, but felt a cold coming on. Mm -hmm. That's the story I started telling. Like, even if it was in the back of my mind, subconsciously, I'm beginning to say, oh no, you know, what's happening this weekend? Like I'm changing plans because I'm probably not going to be able to to go to that thing now because by, you know, four days from now, I'm probably going to feel really bad. It's like, (laughs) I didn't even realize I was doing that. I know it's (laughs) terrible though, isn't it? It's awful. It's like making a plan for this thing that's coming. Oh, a cold's coming to visit. Okay. So make space for it. No, (laughs) I don't want to make space for it. (laughs) So yeah, no, you're right. It is a big, it is a big thing. And then the other thing I wasn't sure I was going to talk about, but you said, you've got to tell that story. So, so our car, was seeming to have a little bit of a transmission problem and it's a it's a mercedes e-class and so we we took it to the mercedes dealership for them to check it out and and if i remember correctly this was in the context of the little experiment you were doing with i feel rich yes 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 so the the experiment was 1000 affirmations a day of i feel rich Mm -hmm. you really you know I feel rich. Mm. I feel rich. I feel rich. <laughs> <laughs> trying to put the feeling in How there. many different ways can I say it? <laughs> right? And so a few days into it, I mean, and all kinds of things started happening, but this was one of them. The transmission, it's the car just didn't want to really shift smoothly. So we took it in and we left it there for them to check it out. And this was, I'm not sure which day of the week it was. We had done... Tuesday and Wednesday podcast. So I think it was a Thursday. 
And they gave us a loaner car, which was a top of the line uh, Mercedes GL. And we were like, wow, this is this one's really nice. Oh. And and so we're we're for sure thinking we're going to have the car and Friday we'll bring it back and they'll have our car fix. Mm-hmm. Well, no, Friday at close of business, they were saying, well, they gave us this list of things and it, and it wasn't wrong things with the car, right? It was like tire change. It was like, <laughs> it was like, no, we don't need all that. We just want to know what's going on with the transmission. Oh, well, they said we haven't gotten to that yet. And so we got to keep the car over the weekend. That Very wasn't cool. this past weekend. It was, was the weekend before. <laughs> Around Wednesday, we still have the car. Wow. And they called us and they said they had sold it because these are the <laughs> brand new cars on the lot. They had sold, they had the, sold car. the car you were loaning. <laughs> right. They had sold it and they needed to um, come pick it up. Well, is our car ready? Well, no, it's not ready yet. So we're going to bring you another one. <laughs> So they brought us another really nice one. We're having fun driving that one. <laughs> so for sure, we think the same thing. As I go, probably our car will be ready on, on Friday. Nope. They said they were getting ready to just change the transmission fluid. Um, but we were they weren't going to have it finished over the weekend. <laughs> so today is Tuesday, and we still have the, the loaner car. It's just hysterical. Um, and so far, it's just been that we needed transmission fluid. That's the only thing that they've done is change transmission fluid in so far. in almost two yeah. weeks. <laughs> so, so basically, their I don't know how else to say it. Their inefficiency has basically been used by the universe as a way to deliver an enormous. I feel rich wind to you by having well, you, you have know, access to I, a and car. And I've told this story before um, about when we had our. Our, when our floors were water damaged and we had to have our floors redone and we, it was supposed to be a job that was going to take three days and we ended up three weeks in a five-star hotel. <laughs> and you know, what's funny is that I don't know if I ever told you this part of the story, but I'm just putting it together myself. This, that was over a year ago. And that was the same thing. I, I made a comment. I said, you know what? I need to pump up the money vibe here. We oh, need really? to pump up this money vibe. Oh, wow. And I wasn't doing I feel rich affirmation, but it was still about we need to. And I made this comment. I said, you know what? We need to go hang out at um, there's like a really nice restaurant downtown that I like. I said, we need to go hang out there and and have lunch or have a drink or something. You know, we need to pump up the money vibe a little bit. Mm-hmm. Well, it was no sooner that 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 happened, that this all fell into place and we end up um the the insurance is going to pay for our hotel and i and i jokingly said what about this hotel and i named the hotel and the guy i thought for sure he was going to say yeah no <laughs> and he goes let me see uh yeah that one's on the list <laughs> what <laughs> so we we get there now this is this is really great because the hotel and i i didn't do this intentionally i just thought this is a really nice hotel and i want to stay there the hotel is in an old bank building and when we got there, our hotel door was painted to look like a, a bank vault door. Really? Okay, so here I was wanting to pump up the money vibe, and suddenly I'm like sleeping in a bank vault. <laughs> <laughs> and That's when we wild. go into the room, the first thing when we open the door is a big full-length mirror, and etched into the glass on the mirror, it says, when you change the way you look at things, things change. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> probably put it, should, probably put it, put that story in the book. Huh? I should have put that one in the book. Well, we should um, probably send that to motel six. They need to put it on all of their mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of funny, but I feel like I'm having a replay of that. And what I'm realizing is both times it was, it was, I feel a direct result, but it certainly was congruent with, the idea of let's get into this better feeling vibe around relationship with money. Very cool. That's really, really great. <laughs> well, I think you did it. You, you matched or exceeded my story. That's pretty darn good. I have to say. <laughs> I don't know. I think we're both feeling rich. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We definitely are. I feel rich, not because of the money. I feel rich because I feel more powerful now. I, I was feel just going to say, you know, 
feeling rich because of the money is one thing, but feeling rich because of the 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 power of the universe it's like that's so much richer <laughs> oh yeah because it's 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 to borrow from the the biblical story it's the difference between getting a fish and learning how to fish it's the difference yeah i mean it affects everything not yes. just money it affects everything in our life so exactly that's so it's not having to win the lottery in order to be wealthy. It's knowing you can win the lottery anytime you want to. <laughs> well, it's and it's kind of knowing it's kind of feeling like you've won the uh energetic lottery just by knowing yes. the power you have, right? And and I want to practice it more. That's why I was doing those affirmations this morning um in the mirror and trying to get myself excited about I want to get to the point where I can make big positive emotion for myself on demand and I want it now. <laughs> I, want I want it, it now. as soon as possible. Cause boy, is is it a good place to be? That's the part I loved about the game on, on Saturday. It wasn't so much that I was winning, although that part was great. It was that the feeling each time of reaching out and saying, I want to get my chip count up to X and then getting there. And then doing it again, and then doing it again. The consistency of it. That's the part that really got me excited. And it made it easier, of course. It made it a lot easier each time that I had a new goal to believe in that goal because that could just happen five times in a row. Why wouldn't it happen a sixth? <laughs> right, exactly. And and also, you know, even the little dips, even the little moments of contrast. Oh, yeah. Um, give you such a good, you know, experience of, of the U-turn, <laughs> the legal U-turn. Yeah, and and they are moments you you call them little, but uh, in my regular poker playing days uh, mentality, those would not have been considered little. Losing half your chips that would be huge. Oh yeah, no. Men mentally, that would be a huge, huge loss, and it would certainly set me up for probably you know losing out of the tournament, you know, just losing all my chips in a couple, three hands, something like that, just because I was on what they call on tilt. I was not in a good space. I was out of alignment. Well, I wasn't out of alignment. That's just it. I was keeping right. in alignment because I was I was just amazed and celebrating all the good things that were happening. And it occurred to me, I can imagine somebody else having the same story you had with your Mercedes. Your Mercedes is in the shop, and they're giving you these loaners, and they're brand new cars. And I can imagine people saying, I can't believe they've had that car for two weeks now. Right. And getting all upset about that, not realizing that they've just had the perfect opportunity to enjoy a brand new Mercedes for a couple of weeks. I can just right. see people exactly. doing that. Exactly. And so, you know, I guess that's why I liked hearing about those moments of contrast in your story, because the way you handled it was sort of like, oh, OK, that didn't work. OK, back to this. Yes, right. Back to square <laughs> one. <laughs> Start again. Make the legal U-turn. Yeah. The legal awesome. U-turn, right. <laughs> Well, one of the things that we are actually the main topic of what we're talking about today, because we're still talking about money and the law of attraction. And we're in is this part one? I think it's part one. I can't remember. Yeah, part one. Is, we're going to be in part one for a while. It but is. There's okay. all these so little segments and in, in the in the hard copy version at the paperback. Anyway, we're at the bottom of page 33. OK, there you uh, go. Creating a book of positive aspects. Yeah, this is big. Anybody who wants to try to replicate the stuff that Cindy and I talked about today, this is a good activity to do. Yeah. And, you know, I love those little um, field notebooks. I, I, I've i done like subscriptions for them and I have so many of them. And it was just hitting me that those little field notebooks are the perfect thing mm. <laughs> to keep this book of positive aspects. So let's let's find out about this. Um it says, in the first year of Jerry and Esther's work with us, they were using small hotel meeting rooms in different cities within 300 miles of their home in Texas to provide a comfortable place where people could gather to address their personal questions with us. There was a hotel in the city of Austin that always seemed to forget they were coming, even though Esther had made arrangements with the hotel, signed contracts, and even called in the days just prior to the event to confirm. The hotel was always able to accommodate them, even though when they arrived, no one seemed to be <laughs> expecting them. But it was very uncomfortable for Jerry and Esther to be in the position of urging the hotel staff to hurry to get the room ready before their guests arrived. <laughs> Finally, Esther said, I think we should find a, ho a new hotel. And we said, that might be a good idea, but remember... You will take yourselves with you. 
What do you mean? Esther asked a bit defensively. We explained, if you take action from your perspective of lack, the action is always counterproductive. In fact, it is likely that the new hotel will treat you just like the last one did. Jerry and Esther laughed at our explanation because they had already moved from one hotel to another for the very same reason. <laughs> oh, okay. A little learning experience <laughs> going on here. <laughs> what should we do, they asked. We encouraged them to purchase a new notebook and write boldly across the front cover of it, my book of positive aspects. And on the first page of the book, write positive aspects of the hotel in Austin. And so Esther began to write, it is a beautiful facility. It is immaculate. It is well situated, very close to the interstate with easy to find directions. There are many different sized rooms to accommodate our increasing numbers. The hotel staff is always very friendly. As Esther was making these entries, her feeling about the hotel changed from one of negative to one of positive. That whole thing right there needs to be underlined. That's so right. I know. I I actually even got my highlighters out this morning. Um, And the moment she began to feel better, her attraction from the hotel changed. She did not write, they are always ready and waiting for us, because that had not been her experience. And writing that would have evoked a feeling of contradiction or a feeling of defense or justification from her. By wanting to feel good and by deliberately focusing her attention more upon the things about the hotel that did feel good, Esther's point of attraction regarding this hotel shifted and then something Esther found very interesting happened. The hotel never forgot they were coming again. Esther want, was amused to I want, realize that I want the to hotel... Something. I want to mention something before you go further here, because this mm-hmm. is really a very key point. Um, reiterating that, that sentence, by wanting to feel good and by deliberately focusing her attention more upon the things about the hotel that did feel good, Esther's point of attraction regarding this hotel shifted, and then something very interesting happened. The hotel never forgot they were coming again. And what I wanted to add in was by wanting to feel good and by deliberately focusing her attention more upon the things about the hotel that did feel good and that she believed. Right. And I was going to circle back around to that, too, when it says she did not write. They're always ready and waiting for us because she didn't believe it. (laughs) Right. And that's the same problem or challenge that we run into sometimes with people not wanting to do affirmations because it feels like they're lying. It's the reason why I said when I chose this, I am, I feel rich. And of course I was chatting about it and he said, why didn't you pick? I am rich. And I said, because I felt like my brain might try to argue with that. Right. Exactly. Like, well, that's not true. Bill Gates is rich. You're not rich. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is counterproductive. Um, right. And so I thought, but no one, you know, feelings and emotions are the unarguable argument. Like, <laughs> If I say to someone, I have a knot in my stomach, or I feel terrific today, there's really no argument that they can give me, because those are my feelings. Well, they could say, well, no, you don't. And you'd say, well, yes, I do. And they could say, well, no, you don't. And they could say, well, yes, you do. And you pretty much ended the argument. There's nowhere to go with that. (laughs) Right. And most of the time, someone's not going to argue with you about how you feel. No, no. Because there's no no real proof, right? So I love this, that she didn't say... Yeah. They're always ready and waiting. Right. Um, right. Because it wouldn't have felt correct to her. And so she still was able to make a list. And I think we all can do this. The list of positive a- aspects that actually are true and that they're true in our experience. We just sometimes have to <laughs> really look with a different oh, perspective. Yes. And, you, and you're absolutely right, too, about why it is people don't do affirmations, because that's why I didn't like and still often don't like doing affirmations, because there is a part of my subconscious mind that says, well, if you're doing affirmations, you're trying to convince yourself something that you know isn't true. And I knew right, that I, that was my, my bugaboo going into doing the mirror work. So I made it a deliberate thing. Yes, I, I wasn't completely convinced that I loved myself, but I, I could buy into it enough that I could at least try to do that. But saying other affirmations to myself in the mirror that I didn't really believe in, I knew I couldn't do that. So instead of doing affirmations, I just said, I'm going to talk to myself in the mirror every day, but I'm only going to tell myself whatever feels true in that moment. 
I'm mm. not going to try to make it the same thing every single day. I'm just going to make it true, whatever feels true in that moment. And that, more than anything else, has enabled me to do it every day. Yeah, and, you know, there are little little tweaks and tricks that you can use in language to help you with an affirmation if you're wanting to say affirmations and they don't feel true. One of them is to add, I'm in the process. Yeah, that's You know, good. if I wanted to do... I am rich. I could do, I'm in the process of becoming rich. And if even uh, feeling is just difficult. Just saying the affirmation puts me into the process, right? It's like step one. So, or I'm in the process of becoming healthier. I'm in the process, or I'm learning to. I'm learning to become healthier, right? Those are little tricks that I've given people before in my coaching practice. If they've wanted to do affirmations, but said to me, they don't work. Like I yeah. stand in front of the mirror or I say, you know, I'm I'm the perfect weight and I know it's not true and then I get upset with myself and then I feel worse than I felt to begin mm. with. It's like, okay. Definitely counterproductive. Right. You can, you can even do it with feeling. I mean, you, you were doing I feel rich because that was one that worked for you. But I know from my own experience, there was a time in my life when I didn't know what I felt about anything. So saying I feel rich would have felt like a lie. But I could certainly have said I'm in the process of learning to feel rich and that would have been true. You know, what's funny is that when I first heard about the whole idea of a thousand affirmations, the person that I heard speaking about it made the comment that, oh, yeah, I didn't believe it at first or it, fe- it didn't feel it felt silly at first. And it felt stupid. And then I felt like it was boring. And then I, and I just kept going. And suddenly, like the feeling was there and it was real. So I kind of went into it with the idea that I was going to do it no matter what it felt like. Mm-hmm. And that I was just going to stay with it and see if the feelings changed. Um, I can't even tell you now if day one, it felt silly. Um, It just, I just did it. Mm. And, you know, on day two, when the $50 Fleming's gift certificate came in the mail. (laughs) (laughs) That was great. Started to get more real and real, right? And more easier to say it. Absolutely. Yeah. When you get concrete results, concrete results definitely make it easier to start believing. No doubt about that. But the point is you can do it even without the concrete results because there have been times where I was getting no concrete results. And what enabled me to stick with it was just finding a way to say something that was true. Even if it hadn't arrived yet, just find some way, like you said, in the process of. In in the process of is a great phrase because you can use that with almost anything. And if it's something that you know you would feel good at, that's a key point. You know you would feel good about it if you were able to get there to that feeling place then use the phrase, I'm in the process of getting there, because that one won't hurt you at all. You can actually believe that on some level. And what actually happens is that you start feeling better. Yes. And that's what keeps you in the loop for doing it, True. is that it feels so good while you're doing it. Mm-hmm. It's like it doesn't even have to bring, at some point, it's not even about the concrete results anymore. It's just about the vibration. In fact, in the early stages, what's even more important is that it doesn't feel bad. It isn't just that it feels good. It doesn't feel bad. It doesn't feel like, oh, this is just right. awful. This is like, really? oh, I feel terrible. It's not like your 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 client who was looking in the mirror and, and telling her stuff and telling herself stuff and, and making it feel worse. It's not like that at all. You know, as long as you're not making yourself feel worse, as long as you're saying stuff that has potential for making yourself feel better, even if you're not feeling better yet, you're on the right track. You're on the Agreed. right track. So I'm going to back up just a few sentences here. Okay. Um, The hotel never forgot they were coming again. Mm. So (laughs) Esther was amused to realize that the hotel had not been forgetting about their agreement because they were uncaring or disorganized. The hotel staff was simply being influenced by Esther's dominant thought about them. Mm -hmm. In short, they could not buck the current of Esther's negative thought. Now, something that this makes me think because we back at the beginning of this page, we found out or the beginning of the section, we found out that this wasn't the first hotel that this had happened with. And so I'm thinking that when they changed hotels, they had had this bad experience of coming to the hotel and the hotel not being ready for them. And they went to this next hotel with that same mindset of thinking it was going to happen again mm-hmm. or or maybe hoping it didn't happen. You're yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Just like we said, right? You have to go from from I don't want to get the cold because I don't want to feel bad to I want to feel good for other reasons. Yes. 
That's, so they were that's still the focused on the hotel. Okay, Esther enjoyed her book of positive aspects so much that she began writing pages on many subjects of her life. We encouraged her to not only write about the things in which she was seeking improved feelings, but to write about things she already felt mostly positive about just to get in the habit of good feeling thoughts and for the pleasure of good feeling thoughts. It's a nice way to live, which is, that's funny. That's what we were just talking about, right? Right. The pleasure of the good feeling thoughts. It's like, it is a nice way to live. It also makes me wonder, because I started, Louise and I started doing, we didn't call it the book of positive aspects. We just started doing an outline of, you know, our wishes and wants and what we're trying to attract. And we did it on the computer rather than in a notebook. Um, But the point is that we started putting an outline together and then we just stopped. That was like months ago. And we Mm -hmm. haven't gotten back to it. And before we did the show today, and as we realized we were talking about this particular section of the book, I was saying, wow, I really got to get back to doing that. I got to turn that into a habit the way I did the mirror work. Because I do know that that, that it works, but I've got the same kinds of resistances to that that I had to affirmations and still do, to some extent, have to affirmations. Because somehow in my mind, I've got it down that if I'm writing this book of positive aspects, I'm going to be writing stuff that isn't true and I won't believe it and I'll lose interest in it. And it's the same well, I, What I like again. is that they said, no, go, go write pages about things that are already good. Yes. Yes. In other words, you're not trying to project into the future. You're writing about what's already good now. Right. And so any situation, and those are the kind of areas in our life that we don't think about a lot because we need you know, to they're, also. they're chugging along nicely and everything's going well. Uh, so that would be a nice way to get into the habit it's of a great looking way. for the positive aspects. Yes, yes. Because when we do that, now it becomes easier to start believing in the improvements because we're feeling good. You can right, only feel- and I think we, we also may see improvements in areas that are already good that we didn't even expect it to get better. Right? Yep, that yeah. happens. That happens in a big way. But the main thing is we're getting ourselves into that positive frame of mind, which is the place we have to be in in order to have positive thoughts. Isn't that funny? You have to be in a positive frame of mind to have positive thoughts. If you're not there, you got to work your way up incrementally to get there. You can't just jump there. That's, no, it's it's too far lesson. of a jump it's most too of far. the time. Especially, yeah. yeah, so you have to do it in small steps. But you can do it. And the way to do it in my book is to do it by writing what you do believe in, what you do think is true, what you do like, what what is going well. And that does work. You do that long enough and you actually do climb the scale. It's amazing. You know, you were talking about doing it on the computer and I, I noticed that they had them get a notebook. Get an actual notebook, yeah. And there is something to be said for writing like when I when I give clients homework, if it's written homework, they don't have to usually turn it in. But, you know, it's like if if it's a journaling exercise, I want them to do it uh, with a pen on paper and not on the computer. And there's a couple of reasons, but it just makes a difference. And I'm not sure why it's it makes a difference with the pen in the hand. But also it's the that we're when we're writing about something that we want, you know, it's it's still in the in the virtual realm. It's still in the metaphysical realm of hopes and dreams and wishes and thoughts and ideas, like a brainstorm. And when it's there, it's like if you've ever brainstormed with someone, um, it's very exciting to start talking about something that you want, some idea that you want to make. And it's because it's light. There's no weight to it. Mm-hmm. And when we start to bring it into the physical to manifest it, of course, that's when there's more weight to it. That's when s- some of the struggles start happening, right? The real life things about bringing it into <laughs> manifestation. Um, but I always like to say that writing it down on paper, we've just begun to bring it into the physical with ink on paper because it's now it's, it's, phys- it's something physical. I think there's a, a validity to what you're saying there. And I, I think it's probably something that a lot of people would do well to follow that piece of advice. The only proviso I would throw in is why it was that I do it on computer. Because for me, first of all, my handwriting is horrible. It's so bad I have trouble reading it, let alone anybody else. And second of all, I don't like writing by hand. I dislike the activity intensely. When a computer first came along and I found I could type, and I'm a fast typist, 
when I found that I could type it out instead of having to write it out, I was doing mental handstands. I was so happy about that. So for me, typing into a computer is a much happier exercise. And there was a study that was done just in the last year or two that I read about where they studied what happens in universities when people in the, when students take two different approaches. One approach is they take a notebook in and they physically write in their notebook you know, what the notes are that they're taking in a class. And the other approach is they go in uh, with a computer and then they basically transcribe verbatim what was said in the class. So maybe they'll make a recording of it and then they'll just type up everything like they're typing a transcript uh, so they have the entire uh, transcript for the, for the day's lecture. And they'll do right. that every day. And what they found is that the ones who wrote in the notebook performed substantially better on exams than really? the ones who transcribed the classes, which reinforces wow. what you're talking about. And I thought about that, and I said, well, I know I do better when I'm actually typing in a computer rather than writing on a notebook. Why is it that the tendency would be to have the results in the other way? And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and it finally came to me. When you transcribe notes, you aren't thinking about them. Mm. You aren't engaged in them. You're just busy transcribing notes. You're like Esther, who is receiving Abraham's message, and you're just spinning it out as fast as you can. Esther mm -hmm. doesn't have time to process all that stuff. She just has right. to get it out as fast as she can. Well, when you're learning something, you have to process it. You have to work with it in your head. And that's part of what you're doing when you're note-taking. You're, you're taking what they said, and you're condensing it, and you're, you're, you're streamlining it into a note that you can put onto a page. So you're working with it. But when, you, you're, when you're transcribing it, you're not doing any of that things. You're just, you're just the transcriptionist. That's it. That's all that you do. Well, when I work with a computer, I work with a computer the exact same way that somebody works with a notebook. I'm working with it in my mind before I type it out. But when I'm mm. working with a, with a notebook, I have exactly the opposite um, experience. My experience is I spend most of my time being frustrated by the fact that I don't have good handwriting and I'm trying to make the handwriting good <laughs> and I don't get to spend any time actually processing the thing I'm writing about. Well, that's funny I, because I would rather type and I, and I force myself uh, or I've gotten myself into the habit of being comfortable in a notebook uh, but as far as like writing, because I'm also a writer, I, I type usually. And then <laughs> I actually joined a workshop one time and it was like we we were only allowed to type when it was like the third draft. We had to do everything. And I was like, oh, no. How am I gonna <laughs> um, and there were people in the workshop that were very resistant and that were saying, no, I cannot do this. I can't <laughs> write this notebook. And but. <clears throat> that's the way we were required to do it. And it was interesting because the teacher said, now, of course, we're talking about, you know, writing for content, but the instructor said, um, there's just something about essays and content that have been written with the hand. They're always more powerful. They always have more emotion. They always connect better. And I thought that was interesting. Of course, I mean, that's just her opinion, but I thought it was. Well, you know, I think it's more than her opinion. I think it's her experience. And I think that's yeah, really what it yes. comes down to. Her experience was she wrote better essays when she hand wrote it. And I think well, she was right a college professor, a university professor, too. Yeah. So she she watched that in her students. Right. Right. So it's like it wasn't just her own experience as a writer, but also her experience as exactly. a teacher that the people that were writing longhand, their essays seem to be, you know, that's more right. Powerful. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, and I think that dovetails perfectly with the study because the study found the same thing. Yeah. I, th I think that the only thing that was missing from the study is that the study didn't understand why the phenomenon was happening. So I would not let the, you know, the bad feelings about writing with a pen keep you from the book of positive aspects if it's something you want to do and you want to do it on the computer i do it on the computer you know what i mean it's well, like it's, i think it, it'd be better to do it than absolutely not do it. <laughs> absolutely that's the worst mistake of all is to just not do it at all because you can't figure out whether to handwrite it or type it you do it one <laughs> way or another because that's a whole lot better <laughs> and i'm excited about this exercise because i hadn't thought about it in a long time um and it, i think it's going to be a powerful thing to do so, Walt, I'm looking at the book. I'm not, I'm not sure if we should launch into this next section or not. Probably not. We only have about five minutes left, so we should probably do a little summary here. And we, we actually haven't done any announcements. We should take a few minutes for announcements. Um, in fact, there's one big one. Starting this coming Sunday, 
David and I, we've been doing the podcast at 11 a.m. We are shifting that to 8 p.m. in the evening. And oh, we're doing, wow. We're doing okay. it for a couple reasons. One reason is we're doing it because this way Louise and I can actually go away for the weekend and not worry about the fact, well, Walt's got to be able to do the podcast at 11 a.m. <laughs> so we can actually go away, come back Sunday evening, and there I am to do the podcast. That's one reason. And then the other reason is that well, if you do it in the evening, that's one more evening that, that listeners who wanted to call in could perhaps call in. Sunday evening is, you know, relatively speaking, a, a calmer time. It's not, you know, you're not at work. You're not uh, having to, to deal with all kinds of stuff. I mean, in some cases, you're putting away, you know, putting the kids to bed and so forth. But uh, for the most part, it's a calmer time. So maybe we can get some more people calling in. That would be really cool. So tell, tell me again what time that is. It's Sunday evenings at 8 so p.m. It's Sunday Eastern? evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, there may possibly be times, just depending on whether Louise and I get back from uh, wherever we've gone for the day trip, and <laughs> there may be times where it's a little bit later. But we're aiming at 8 p.m. Eastern time um, on Sunday evening. So yeah, that's the new time slot on Sundays. Great. Yeah. Now the other thing to talk about is, of course, we're still doing the Tuesday night one. That's Tom Wells and I doing the Tuesday night one at 9 p.m. And that one is expressly for people who want to call in during the work week, but they can't do it during the day when we're doing either the morning or the afternoon podcast. So I want to remind people we we have had people call in. We, two, we've, we, let's see, we've, we've had three shows so far in that time slot. Two of them we had people call in, so that was really great. In fact, last week we had BJ call in. He, he says uh, he, he listens to us while he rides his tractor in Mississippi. I love that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he called in also um, with a suggestion. He suggested a way to add some links to make it easier for people to get to the homepage from the podcast. And he sent me some information about how to do it. And I looked it up and read it up, and I realized it was a pretty easy thing to do. And I did it. And sure enough, if you have uh, – I'm not sure which iPhone version it is uh, where the cutoff is, but if you have one of the newer iPhones – if you now look at the description of each of our podcasts, you'll see at the end links that will take you right to the homepage to either listen to the live player or do the uh, subscribe and share or do any – I mean all the stuff that's, that you can do on the homepage, you can now link to from there. So that's another cool thing that came out of just having the Tuesday night podcast. That was really that's great. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, really good. So a listener who actually was giving some good help and, and made a difference. Um, and then finally, I just want to remind people that we are still working on the book. I finally got back to editing the book on Sunday, like I suggested I was going to do, and did some work on it yesterday. I'm going to do some big work on it today, and I'm hoping to get the editing done this week. If I can get it done this week, we're going to have the book out be long before the end of March. So it's coming really, really soon. So I just Very want to good. make sure that's coming out, too, and let people know about that. I'm so excited about it. It's going to be so much fun to read. And I'm adding stories as we go. I'm going to add the poker stories. <laughs> ah, it, it just keeps growing and growing. <laughs> Got to add that one. That story is amazing. I've already, I've, I've already been thinking like, can I remember that story so I can tell? <laughs> well, I'll also include. I don't know how long the link will stay up, but I'm going to include the link to the video too. So if anybody wants to see my replay video where it looks like I'm, I'm playing on TV, they can see that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much fun. I have some friends that play professional poker and um one of them got to go play in the world series of poker. oh no kidding wow and um it was really really exciting uh daniel negrano told her that she was one of the best players at the table and so that really? made her whole life right <laughs> oh if he told me that he in my opinion he is the best player in the world he really <laughs> is he is favorite. an amazing he he has this incredible ability to read your hand to the card every time it's just amazing what he's able to do. So if he says that, I, I tip my hat to your friend because she's really good. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun knowing that she was playing, you know, and being able to watch it. So it made me think about your video, which yeah. is so great. Oh, that's fantastic. So this has been a, a good Tuesday morning. Um, let's see. Before we go, we want to give, give you a chance to tell people if someone wants to have a way to talk to somebody privately and personally about their own specific situation, you're a life coach. That's what you do. So how do they reach out to you? That's what I do. And, you know, I'm, I'm also a relationship coach. So uh, the interesting thing is everything's a relationship, right? That's so right. even the relationship we have with money and with our body and with ourselves. So, yeah, they can find me. Online at cindychavez.com, C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z.com. And I would love to have you come find me online and just say hello. Sounds great. Cindy, it's been a pleasure. Let's do it again tomorrow. 
Let's do it tomorrow. All right. We'll see you all again next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.